Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down with Loggy Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove, Newfoundland, Labrador, Councillor Ashley Jackson. But before we get into today's interview, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to our newest subscribers. Thank you to Rachel from Nova Scotia and Jonathan from Saskatchewan. Your contributions have made this show what it is today. So thank you so much. Now, if you want to be a backer of the Cross Border Interviews, head over to our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and hit the Support Us Now page today. Now, on to the interview. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to sit down and do this interview. I, I want to start with the question I've asked a lot of municipal councillors, so you're no exception to my first question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? It's funny. So when I was looking at some of your other interviews, I sort of thought about this question. And I guess I realized I've always been doing it. So I moved around a little bit when I was younger. So when I found myself going to high school, I found that nothing happened in my high school unless I was the one to organize it. So I think I always got really involved with my community. And then I went through the cadet program, which gets you incredibly involved with the community. And then when I had kids, I instantly joined the student council because I just, there was no other place in the world I had to be, but other than they're in their school and getting involved as much as possible. So once my kids got a little bit older, grade three and grade four, I then decided that maybe I would think about council. Um, and I didn't right away, but then I've been on council now five years. So it was just the right time, right? time for my town. It's not very often uh, vacancies came available. Um, I actually ran the first time on a by-election and did not get in and then had the opportunity to run a couple of months, uh, months later. So I think I'm five years. My very first council uh, meeting, I apologize, was five years just a couple of days ago. Well, happy anniversary, I guess I should say. Yeah, but crazy actually. So it seems like if you were involved in student council like I was, you were a politically minded kid growing up. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Not at all in my house, actually. Not <laughs> so even how a little does, bit. How does the person go from not talking about the politics at the dinner table to getting so actively involved? We have this show on our local radio network called Open Line. I highly suggest you listen to it sometimes just to sort of get an inner workings of Newfoundland. It is... Super educational, sometimes funny, and a little bit ridiculous sometimes. But I sort of grew up listening to the Nightline version of that. So my great-grandparents always listened to it. And I just always thought it was so interesting to listen to people all across the province and sort of see what's going on there. So I've always had like an inclination to watch the news and listen to the news. But my house is the far from political. That never was. What was the draw to municipal politics? Because I think that's the crux of where this show comes from is you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, you could have chosen school board. But at the end of the day, in that first election you ran, where you ran for mayor, as you just said, uh, you decide to put your name for it municipally. What was the allure of municipal politics? Well, the first time I ran, I actually ran just on a regular by-election. And then I got in the second time as a councillor. Um so I guess it was just, so basically I was living away for a little while. I wanted to move back to where I was from because it was a small school. My kids went to a school that was under 200 kids. It was like a community driven school. So that was really important for me to give, get back there, I think, and give back and know that my kids were in an environment that I loved and grew up in. Um, and really, I think it was just, they needed another voice at the table. I'm a little bit outspoken sometimes. I don't, Sometimes I forget to have a filter, but at the end of the day, re regarding whether it's my kid or somebody else's kid, I'm going to advocate for that child. So I sort of felt like there needed to be a different type of voice on the table, because at that point, there was nobody really my age, except for one other person. Um, and we both sort of had similar views, I guess, but it wasn't typical of our town. Why do you think that is? Do you, do you, why do you think that people aren't as outspoken when it comes to municipal governance as traditionally provincial or federally and I'll, I'll be honest I, I see your social media and it seems like you're vocal at all levels of government and it doesn't seem like it's just a municipal issue but no. why do you think more people are not as uh 
engaged municipally or are they engaged in the town of, and I want to make sure I get this right here because I have to read it every single time, Loggy Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, up in, we haven't had a lot of female counselors and that was one of the reasons that I really, really wanted to get involved with our town. I mean, to be quite honest, that it's to no secret that I sort of felt our town was a little bit old school and that there needed to be more people that were willing to put themselves out there. So I've always been involved in the community, whether it be volunteering uh, regarding mental health or volunteering with military wives associations. So I found that there was just something missing at the table. And I found that, you know, the voices that were at the table were pretty similar in opinion, which is great, you know, and that's how a town effectively runs. But at the same time, I felt that there was things that weren't being talked about that could be talked about. And one of them definitely in our town was women in politics. So that was sort of something that I wanted to make sure that I jumped on board and got involved with right from the get-go. What were the issues that you were hearing in that first election and then the, that subsequent by-election that you were elected? Were they more municipal issues? And why did you think that the issues that you were hearing would be best served with your voice at council? Because everyone has their own voice, everyone has their own opinions, but you thought, I'm hearing these issues. I think my voice uh, as a female, and uh, you, you just openly said that, that you believe that a woman's voice should be, should be around the table, which is I completely agree with. What was it about the issues that you were saying, okay, these local issues that I'm hearing about, I really need to advocate for them and I need to be around that council table? I think some of it was the fact that I was a mom of three young kids. So my oldest is 14, my twins are 13. So I have three kids under one. So that dynamic alone is very different than a lot of people, I think, in my town at the time. And just in general, you know, it it leaves, I guess, a lot of room for thinking about, you know, whether it be our school area or parks and recreation or um, even the safety when it comes to road safety. So my first, I think the first time I ran road safety was my biggest one because I was constantly on the road with my kids. Um, and I noticed that there's definitely some things that we could do in the school zone. Um and the biggest thing I heard was uh, probably road safety. And it's funny, I live in a, but we didn't have a, a great trail system whatsoever. And the roads are maintained somewhat by us and somewhat by the provincial government. So therefore you have a little less control when they're being run for, for, uh, by the provincial government. So that was safety and uh, parks, I think, and recreation were the biggest reasons I sort of got involved. When you were knocking on doors, I'm assuming you door knocked in the yeah. traditional campaign sense. It, I hate asking this question because I always feel like I'm painting a broad stroke, but I think I need to ask it more often. When you were talking to residents of your community, were people talking about municipal issues or were they talking about other levels of jurisdictional issues, whether it be provincial or federal, whether it be healthcare, whether it be mental health and addiction housing? Because I, 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 I'm a strong proponent that people traditionally don't understand the levels of jurisdictional roles that come with municipal government. And I I, I love hearing the, the silver lining where people say, no, actually, my community actually does understand that. So for you, when you were door knocking, you talk about road safety, you talk about parks, were that those seem traditionally like in the municipal jurisdiction, but were people talking about just municipal jurisdictional rule uh, issues or were they talking about a gambit of issues? I think a bit of a gambit of issues. I think with our um, community and specifically, and some of it might be, you know, because I was involved with the previous MHA, I had volunteered on some of his campaigns. So people knew I had a connection to him. So I fe felt like they were bringing up not just issues that involved our community, but issues that involve the province in general. I have to say our residents are pretty in tune though with our town. They keep up to date. I mean, there's not a day that doesn't go past that I don't hear from at least three or four residents, I'll, at least phone calls. And every time I go walk, you know, you have to sort of be prepared to add an extra half hour to it because you're going to run into somebody. Um, but our issue, our town doesn't have a huge lot of issues. Like we're really, really lucky, to be honest. There is about 2,300 people that live in our town, 960 homes approximately, but we're right on the outskirts of St. John's. So if your kids in swimming lessons, they're going to St. John's. If they're in hockey, they're going to St. John's. So we're sort of considered like a bedroom community. So I think our issues are less complex than they can be other places. The difference is I think is that our property value assessment is very high for our province. It's one of the highest. So because of that, we have really um, built up areas of our town, but then we have areas of our town that have the same people living there for 60 years. 
So sometimes the expectation from some people is that, well, if I have a million dollar home, then, you know, I'm expecting A, B, C, and D, where someone, if they've lived there their whole life, their expectations are different, I find. So I find that now, especially, we're getting a big mix of provincial and municipal issues sort of knocking at your door. Uh, we're going to be talking about issues in a few minutes here in the second part of the segment, but I, I want to pick up on something that you just said, and I, I find it fascinating. Uh, you, you've been in politics for some time now, uh, volunteering, and then also as an elected official, uh, you're, you're a mom. How do you balance the life of a, a, a and I say this with respect to every time every time I ask this question, but how do you balance the life of a part-time counselor with full-time responsibilities as a counselor with being a parent who wants to make sure that their family's looked after as well? Sometimes it's easier than others, to be honest, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, really. Sometimes it's really tough. It's tough to sort of take on your own issues that you need to advocate for within your own family. And then be a mom and work full time and then be a full time, part time counselor. And on top of that, you know, most people I know who are really involved with municipal, uh, municipal politics, you're involved with some other politics. So I also do public relations for an ongoing uh, leadership campaign. So I think it's, it's a balance, but I think without being busy, I would be a little bit lost, to be honest. And I would always rather be more involved and in the know than not know anything at all. So if there's something that needs to be done, I'd rather be a part of it and know that I'm making sure that it also gets done than sort of sit back and just look. It do your kids well for me at all? Do your kids understand that if mom goes to the grocery store, she could be about a half hour, forty five minutes to go in to run a gr grab a carton of milk because the, more likely than not, she's going to be stopped and ask questions about the t issues of the day. One of my kids is really intrigued by it all. He's always like interested when we go somewhere and I get stopped and he's like, who's that person? And especially now, because I'm more involved with provincial politics as well. Um, two of the other ones could care less. They like roll their eyes and like, can you just stop talking to people or, but my dog loves it. We walk twice a day and everybody knows him. And it's funny. He actually got out yesterday and he never gets loose. And I was like, oh no. So I walked down the road a little bit and there was an older lady pulled in and my dog was sat in her front seat. She said, I opened his door and he got in. And I was just like, I knew you'd come looking for him. I was like, well, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, that That's precious. It's great that a small town or a community like yours does that because traditionally in larger urban centers, that would not be happening. Um, oh. But I want, I want to talk about the town for a second. And before I start this line of questioning, I'm going to preface this statement, question, uh, preface it by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. I seem to get emails about this question all the time. I do not know why, but people seem to be upset when I ask this question. Counselor, in your opinion, at the time of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue or issues? And I know you said they, there's not many, but what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Loggy Bottom, Middle Cove, Outer Cove? So the definitely the biggest issue in our town is road safety. So it and it sort of incorporates our town uh, municipally, but also provincially. We have a main road that goes through our town. It's called Marine Drive. The province is actually responsible for it. And if you've seen my social media, you've probably seen the videos and posts I make about it. Um, but it's one of the main thoroughfares of our town. And unfortunately, because we're not able to fix it ourselves and the province has to do it, it's probably the biggest issue we hear knocking at our doors all the time. It's not really considered safe. It's our scenic coastline, but yet people aren't able to access it. So definitely hands down that and trail system. People want to get off the road and want to get in the woods. Because of where I live, you have to have a one acre lot, which people who live in, rural, in urban areas, that's a huge amount. A property. So people expect that if I had to have a one acre lot, then there should be a trail system. So it's definitely something our town is working on now. We're working on a trail system plan. So it's super exciting after being there for five years that we've definitely, we're working towards that at least. So your first election you run and you talked about that road safety was your primary concern. Yep. You're still saying that it's an issue today. What is this council and yourself doing to make the roads more safe for families, for residents, for everyone in your community? I know you talk about the provincial jurisdictional uh, road that they have. 
but municipally you can be doing things to make people feel like they're going to have some action on this issue. What are you doing and what's council doing to make road safety a top priority? So when I first came to council, my first position, I guess, on council was I was chair of safety uh, committee. And that was an amazing experience. One thing that I really wanted our town to work on was our school zone area. Um, and it, cook, it took a couple of years, but we did actually completely revamp our school zone area. And now we have sidewalks, which sidewalks in rural areas is unheard of. And it was a huge commitment, but I was so, so glad that our council supported the idea. And we were able to achieve that two years ago. So that was a big improvement to our town. It's made huge impact, I think, to everyone because it's such a busy area because our church and the school is so close together. And you have a school of 200 kids, which doesn't sound like a lot. But you have a school of 200 kids that have probably two sets of grandparents and two sets of parents who go to everything. So it's such a condensed area and it gets really, really um, busy. So that's a huge improvement that we've made. Another thing that we've done, we put speed radar signs on our roads and we also changed the uh, speed zones. So now all of our side roads are now 30 kilometers an hour. So we're definitely making progress in that area. But unfortunately, some of the areas that are the most um problem area is not one that we have a whole lot, of, whole lot of control over. So I think that's, you know, municipally wise, that's where you sort of need to use your mouth and you need to be vocal. And if it means you have to knock on someone's door or sit in someone's office or be really loud and invite them to coffee on a road that's falling apart, then that's what you do. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask the very political question here, but I feel like you're up for it. Is the provincial government listening to municipal concerns, do you think? Yes and no. Um, are they doing what they can? Sometimes. Do I think that our MAJ is progressive conservative? It's Jody Wall. He's absolutely fantastic. And we're so, so lucky to have him, to be honest, because he is someone who will stand in any snowstorm, any rainstorm. It could be a hundred kilometer hour winds and he's going to stand there with you and he's always going to advocate for you. And he's available 24 seven. Provincially, the provincial government, I feel like sometimes it falls on deaf ears. And something that's so important to our residents, I feel like is not as important to them. So I think that municipal wise, there almost needs to be a bit of a gap bridge sort of thing that, you know, we need more communication with our MHA or MHAs and the city members. Luckily, our MHA, like I said, is really vocal, but the minister is not necessarily all the time. So mm -hmm. I think that, and depending on your MHAs, obviously, whether they're in power or not, that in, definitely impacts our communities. I I think that nobody would disagree with that whatsoever. So it's sort of tough. Are they listening? Yes. Are they doing enough about it, in my opinion? No, to be honest. And I don't really mind saying that 10 times. Do you feel like municipalities are left holding the bag? Because uh, there's a lot of downloading happening to municipalities right now, whether it be from federal government, provincial governments. Uh, do, do you feel like municipalities are trying to do this by themselves and trying to solve issues like road safety by themselves while federal and provincial governments are not coming to the table as much as they should or addressing the issues that municipalities are facing? I think that we're the ones left to deal with the problem that we can't fix. And that's the sad part about it. So you mean, are people reaching out to our MHJ constantly? Are people reaching out to us every single day? You know, it's when I walk people, walk up past people in the daytime, you know, they're talking about the road safety or when you up in the barricades are there because the rocks are falling into the ocean, you know, obviously it's a topic of conversation. Um, I do think that, yeah, I think I would sum it up that we're the ones dealing with the problem, but they're the only ones that can fix it. And that's sort of the sad part of it. Now, you you are a town, but I looked on a map and I, I will be the first to admit that I've never been to your community. I'm hoping to get there this summer or th this this awesome. October when I'm there for the municipalities Newfoundland and the Labrador conference. I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping to be there and hopefully be able to meet you in person. Um, but I looked on a map and it seems like a traditionally rural area. Is that would that be a correct statement? Yep, definitely. We're a real rural community for sure. So you talk about how you're a bedroom community and a lot of people move for or go back and forth to St. John's, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, what's the economy like in uh, your community right now? Because the, the affordability crisis is pretty prominent across Canada. Are you seeing it impact your community as well? 
It's a really debatable topic, depending who you talk to in our town. In my well, opinion, I'm, I'm I'm asking the counselor that I'm sitting in front of with right now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't think we're doing enough for um, housing at all, and I think that, like I said, I live in a town that probably has the highest property value in all the province, um, but that's not nece- necessarily that's not what our town necessarily represents. I think we have such we have you know, $2 million, million dollar homes. And then we have homes that sell for $180,000. You know, if you go to buy a lot in my town, it's anywhere from a hundred to $170,000. But exactly. And that's, that's just kind of a lot. weird sentiment there, because if you're buying a house for 180 and the lots are 170. Hmm. Yeah. So like, I think our town is, it's really diverse when it comes to economic value from one part of it to the other. I think though that, you know, we're not doing enough when it comes to low income housing availability. Um, and I've been pretty vocal about it. Like I, I feel like I, and I'll be totally honest, I moved away and moved back. The only reason I was able to move back to my town and afford it was because somebody older who was selling their home. And that's, that's the reality of it. And most people my age who want to come home can't afford to move back to our town. So I do hope that whether it's this council or the next one, we look at sort of trying to fill that gap because there's so many people in our town um, or so many people from our town that would love to come back, but they truly can't just afford it. You have to make some pretty big choices around that council table and you've been on council for five years now. So I can imagine you've gone through some budget cycles where property taxes may have to increase was particularly in this day and age where affordability is on a lot of people's minds, is it hard for you to make tough choices or how do you see yourself weighing the responsibility of making the tough choices where, you know, it could impact someone's bottom dollar in your community. And it could mean that they go paycheck to paycheck or uh, decide if they're going to get food or rent this month. That's the hardest part I struggle with. So I, again, I think when it comes to the demographic of, of our town, I'm sort of on the outskirts. Yeah. Realistically, I'm actually a single mom of three kids and I work full time and then I'm involved in everything I possibly can be in some ways. Um, but most of the households in our town, I would imagine they're double income households with great incomes. But then we have seniors who I know that are struggling whether or not they buy their medication or whether they buy groceries. So that's probably the toughest part I find of the job because one, I find that it's really, for some people, it's really hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Whereas I feel that one thing that I really like about our town is that I find like I eat can relate to both groups of people, I guess. And I really want to make sure that I don't want that somebody move to our town who has wanted to always live there, build a million dollar home, but then can't afford to keep it. At the same time, I don't want a resident who's been there their whole entire life and can't afford to heat it. So I think that we're really lucky in our town that we actually haven't had to raise our rates like in a very, very long time. We're the lowest, probably Northeast Avalon for sure. Um, But I mean, as services are getting more expensive, you know, there's always that possibility, I think, of an increase in our town. But I think that my biggest always, I always say is that I'm always going to be there for the residents to talk to you. So when an important decision is um, being made, I often put it out on my own social media. I'll often tell anyone to call me. I'm pretty accessible and they do. So I'm really, really grateful for that because at least at the end of the day, I feel like even if I'm the only one voting for something or voting against something, I know that I'm doing it with as much information as possible. But you make the ultimate end of the decision. You make the decision at the end of the day. Um, then you have to go out and sell it as well because you're not going to please 100% of the people in your community. And I can imagine after your time in office, you understand that. Um, yep. How how much respect comes into play when you make important decisions that you have you, you can have those tough conversations with people who say, this isn't how I told you to vote or this isn't, this isn't how I said my opinions are and you don't I don't feel like you've listened to me. Is there respect that comes into play when you're willing to actually have those tough conversations with people who are uh, upset with some of the decisions you've made? Yeah, I don't think I've only had a couple people sort of get really, really mad with me. And and they weren't mad with me. They were mad at the situation. Oh, and at God. the end of the day, sometimes I just think you need to shut up and listen and, you know, make sure that they feel heard. And at the end of the day, I think that's anybody just wants to feel heard. And if I feel like if you 
open up all the lines of communication as possible, it makes it a little bit easier. I mean, there's definitely decisions around our council table that I haven't agreed with. And I have no issue saying, you know, this is obviously not something I voted in favor of. You can obviously see that. But I do support council's decision at the end of the day. And I think that's really important for anybody who's sitting at a council table. You can have a different opinion. You don't have to agree with it. But you really do need to support council. And everybody needs to be on the same page there. I think a lot more counselors need to take out a, a page from your book there and agree, uh, just echo what you just said, because I think there's a lot of counselors who, when the vote doesn't go their way, they're upset and they don't go uh, respectfully out of councils and sell the message that council voted on. So thank you for saying that. I, I, I want to talk about sort of the local issues because you have your issues that you believe are passionate, whether it be road safety, trail systems, but I'm assuming, because you've just told me that you, you're hearing from local residents about their local issues as well. You you know, and I know, municipalities do not have an endless supply of money. They do not have an endless supply of money that can solve everyone's issues. So when it comes to budgets, when it comes to addressing the issues, you have to talk to people, listen to them, as you said, but then tell them sometimes, unfortunately, the town can't do what you want because we just don't have the money to do that. How how do you balance the needs of the town with the individual? That's a tough one. So I think that, you know, everybody everybody has a priority based on what they need individually. Um, for the most part, you know, they are similar in our town. But then you do get those people who might say want a speed bump in their neighborhood because they feel like the, the roads aren't safe in their area. And those ones are probably the, some of the tougher conversations, as funny as it sounds. Because our town, like I said, is not very big, but we have to have some kind of formula for speed bumps, for example. But everybody wants one on the road in front of their house so their child is more safe. And I get that. And that's probably the hardest conversation weekly I have with somebody who you know is saying, you know, they're speeding up and down our road or they're hanging out on our road and I don't feel it's safe. Now, what can I do about it? And nobody wants any parent to go to bed at night time wondering if their child's going to be safe when they ride to ride to the next day. But I think that, again, it's one of those things that, that I just think you need to keep on bringing things to the council table. And one thing that whether my fellow counselors love it or hate it, I bring everything to the table, everything, because at the end of the day, that's the whole reason I'm there. If somebody can't call me and say, Ashley, you know, our ditches aren't cleared or the road wasn't safe or my water is even discolored, even though we don't we have don't have septic water in our area. At least I feel like I can give them some kind of direction. But when it comes to budget time, everybody has a bit of a different idea. Our recreation program is amazing in our town, and we're incredibly lucky to have such an amazing group of volunteers that run Kelly Park Sports Association. But they always need more money, of course. I mean, nothing happens unless there's more money put into it. So that's a really tough one because recreation is such a big part of our town. But overall, I feel that people are, they're pretty good when it comes to the budget. They know what we can't afford. I feel like we're really transparent. I know I'm super transparent. If somebody wants to know how much this person makes, well, you know what? It's public information. If you want to know how much our, I don't know what they call it, stipend maybe is, I have no issue telling anyone. Because I think the more information that you put out there, the better opinion and better judgment people are going to make. And they're going to be less upset with you knowing that exactly what you're working with kind of thing. Are people engaged? Are people willing to give you their honest feedback and willing to actually engage in conversations with you, you about the issues of the day, or they just want to vent and have their issues heard? Because I, I worked in municipalities and I know as the communications and marketing person for a municip small municipality, it is hard to get people to actually engage with people on the issues that are important to the municipality because people have their own lives. And for you, who are who's so active on social media, do you find people actually wanting to engage on the issues of the day yep the good the bad and the ugly to be honest and i think <laughs> yeah. that i'm lucky that way like some people would say it's a curse but i actually i'm really grateful for it to be honest because i know that there's probably not everybody around the council table gets the same kind of interaction that i do but i'm yeah i'd actually find people whether i want to hear it or not or whether they want to hear my opinion or not it's really open and yeah, I'm super grateful for it, to be honest. I'm really lucky because not everybody um, 
has their phone or their messages or whatever going off. But I would rather someone reach out to me a thousand times a day than not reach out to me at all. You're you're a, you're a unicorn out there in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador <laughs> there so. because I, well a lot of people who might not agree with that statement. Um, so I want to turn to my last subject because I am cautious of time here, and I want to talk about an issue that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is tourism. I love tourism. I think more people should be visiting our great communities in Canada because I think they all have hidden gems, and I'm looking forward to visiting your community when I get out to the Atlantic Definitely. provinces, hopefully this year. I want to know from you, though, what are some of the hidden gems that tourists need to see in your community? If you've never been to our town, I think everybody has to go to Middle Cove Beach. It's like my favorite spot in the world. I go there at least once a day with my dog. Outer Cove Beach is like a little great secret that nobody, it's like right out in the open. There's nothing secret about either one of these places. It's the biggest tourist spots that we have. But not a lot of people go to Outer Cove Beach. Ocean Science Centers is run by MUN. There's like a touch tank and stuff there in the summer and there's seals there all year round, which is I'm still like the same seal is there. I think that since I was a little girl and I still go back all the time and see. Um, and our trail system, like the East Coast Trail, I don't know if you're familiar, but it has some of the most beautiful sites in Newfoundland and Labrador right across our province. And I particularly love the trail system. The one that's from Middle Cove Beach, the Motion and Torbay. Uh, that's probably my favorite one to do with my dog often. But it's just really, it's a scenic route. That's what they call it, sort of. Like you drive down through a town and you're right on the ocean, essentially. And it has a lot to offer, even though we're right next door to St. John's. I think it feels like you're escaping, but you're really not. Where do you go to escape? You talk about the trail system, but is there a certain watering hole or a place where you can just go and decompress and let it all go away? Just you, after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, after a long day of just being who you are, just go and just recenter yourself so that way you know tomorrow morning is a new day, you're going to be at it again, and that you're going to be able to get back to it with 100% of your ability to do it. I think Middle Cove Beach is my definitely my spot. Early in the morning, I think I leave my house around 5.30ish every morning. Um, and sometimes on the weekends, if I'm home and not busy, then I'll go down there like 11 o'clock at night. I love it for two reasons. One, if you don't want to be talked to, nobody talks to you. But if you're up for a conversation, there's always not just local people, which I absolutely adore, some of the seniors that spend a lot of time there. But I find I talked to a couple from the UK a couple of mornings ago, and they were first time ever in Newfoundland. And it was so nice to talk to them about not just our town, but our province. So it's one of those places where you can have a great conversation or you can be completely by yourself. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. So we're going to end on the million dollar question here. And I think it's the most important one I ask all the, all municipal councillors. And I think every municipal councillor is able to answer it, but I just like to ask it anyway. What makes your community of the town of Loggy Log? Wow, I can't even, I'm just going to cut this for a second. What makes your community such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? I think we have, because we're so close to St. John's, but yet you feel like you're completely isolated. I think it's like the best of both worlds. And having one acre lots, although it's not everybody's dream, you don't see what your neighbors are having for breakfast or you have complete privacy and you know your your dog is free and there's chickens everywhere. There's, there's some chickens on a road close to my house and sometimes they escape and I can literally pick the chicken up and put it back in. Like that doesn't happen everywhere. You know, so I think that it's just the best of both worlds. I really do. Like, I think we're in a rural coastline. I can escape to see the ocean. I'm really, really quiet nights. I can hear the ocean, but yet I'm six minutes away from the city. Well, oh, six minutes away from St. John's, yeah. really? Probably like, to be honest, I can walk just like technically St. John's in probably 20 minutes. We're only 20 minutes from the airport. Not even. I guess living in Alberta where everything's like three hours apart from everything, like 20 minutes seems like such a small space, but here we are. Um, Counselor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this today. I, I, I appreciate it when municipal counselors are willing to talk about themselves and the reason why they got municipal politics, but also their communities. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. And I have to say, when I looked at your list, I think it's great that you are interviewing female counselors out there because there's definitely less of us out there 
But I think that the more of us that get involved, and I mean, females, gender diverse people, anybody really, the more people that talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think the more people who realistically will want to get involved for the right reasons. So kudos to you for doing what you're doing. It's great. Well, thank you so much. I was always appreciative when people blow smoke up my butt from time to time. So thank you very much. Um, but I also want to take a moment and say thank you for serving your community. I, I don't think municipal councillors get enough uh, kudos for serving their communities and making their communities a better place. So thank you so much for doing that as well. Um, and I look forward to hopefully meeting you either in October or Definitely. sometime next year when I'm out in the elected provinces and giving a big tour of all four provinces out there. Amazing. Yes, for sure. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross-Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.